Good evening. Hello, welcome to this symposium on Christian on the future of Christian art. It is a delight to see you all here. Thank you for making the time in your day to join us. This uh, symposium is made possible by the Father Paul Mankowski Memorial Fund, uh, which is in honor of the Lumen Christi Institute's longtime scholar in residence uh, known for his broad interest in the humanities. And it is also co-sponsored by the U of C's Committee on Social Thought. It's a particular joy for me to be here with you to introduce this event. My name is Danny Wasserman, and I am the new director of the Lumen Christi Institute here in Hyde Park. For those who don't know, the Lumen Christi Institute's mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a vital dialogue partner in academic communities at the University of Chicago in the city and beyond. So it's an honor to have three distinguished individuals join us here for this symposium and to have all of you here as well. I am a, a U of C grad, graduated class of 2006, and so it's especially delightful to be here and in a, in a new capacity and to be introducing this interdisciplinary discussion. Uh, as an undergraduate and later as it, when I was doing my graduate work elsewhere, I came to know the U of C as a place that fostered discussions along interdisciplinary lines. And so tonight we have such a discussion and I'm glad that you could be here for it. I'd like to say just a little bit about our a couple of upcoming events that may be of interest to you. In a few days, on Thursday, October 27th, we will have an event on the future of natural law. That's, again, Thursday, October 27th at 5 p.m. And the following week, November 2nd through 4th, we are co-sponsoring with the Divinity School a conference in honor of Jean-Luc Marion, and the title of the conference is The Contribution of Theology to Rationality. And if you don't remember the details, you can look them up on our website, lumenchristi.org. And now I have the honor of introducing our speakers for today. First is Father Stephen Fields. Father Fields is the Hackett Family Professor of Theology at Georgetown University, and he has taught there since 1993. He has a PhD from Yale in philosophy of religion and a doctorate, excuse me, a licentiate in sacred theology from the Western School of Theology. He is the author of Being as Symbol on the Origins and Development of Karl Rahner's Metaphysics, and he is also the author of Analogies of Transcendence, an essay on nature, grace, and modernity. And he is the recipient of the Dorothy M. Brown Award for Excellence in Teaching at Georgetown. Next, Dr. Karen Krause is the Associate Professor of Byzantine Theology and Visual Culture at the U of C's Divinity School. She's an art historian and specializes in the, visual, the Christian visual culture of Byzantium and the pre-modern Mediterranean. Her first book is The Illustrated Homilies of John Chrysostom in Byzantium, and it won an award from the Southeast Europe Association. And her most recent book is Divine Inspiration in Byzantium, Notions of Authenticity and Art in Theology, published earlier this year by Cambridge. And finally, John David Mooney is an internationally recognized Chicago-based sculpture and environmental artist, and he's most known for his site-specific and large-scale public works, experimenting with light and architecture to transform buildings and public spaces. He has his MFA from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and he has taught at University of North Carolina, as well as the University of Southern Indiana, as well as many others. Thank you again, folks, for joining us, and now I'll turn it over to Father Fields. Uh, thank you, Danny, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to discuss with you how our own situation, that is the context in which we now live our lives of discipleship, in which, in other words, we pray, worship, believe, do our work, and exercise our responsibilities, a context often broadly called modernity, how this situation is leading us, even demanding of us, 
to refashion Christian art in order to communicate the beauty of the Christian message in new forms that hope to be effective for our times. This is a rich and complex topic. I will need, for instance, to speak about the nature of beauty, especially the distinctive nature of Christian beauty. I will need to define the distinctiveness of modernity and the relation of its distinctiveness to art. And I will need to talk about how modernity differs from previous epochs of Christian art, especially the Baroque age, with which modernity so keenly poses a contrast. So let us begin with this last mentioned topic and work our way through the other topics in a coherent order. The Baroque age is a great high point of Christian visual art and hence of the representation of the beauty of Christ and his saving message. It occurred from roughly the last quarter of the 16th century, so from 1575, until the middle of the 18th century, or about 1750. The late contemporary philosopher of culture, Louis Dupre of Yale University, argues that the passing of the Baroque age lost for Western culture its last great harmony between the realms of nature and of grace. In theological terms, nature means the finite created order made by God as totally good from nothing, but it has become blighted by the sin of Adam. Grace means the gift over and above the created order that God freely and lovingly gives us in Christ, which redeems us from sin, makes us new creatures, and gives us the potential for eternal life as the beatific vision of God himself. Baroque art achieved a harmony between nature and grace, such is the distinctive thesis of Louis Dupre. It achieved this harmony by understanding the human person as dynamically related to God, who in turn is dynamically related to human persons because God is the living wellspring and source of all human creativity, genius and invention. Now, in this dynamic understanding between God and the human person, human artistry is appreciated not only because it follows its own professional rules and standards of doing art, but because in the very complexity of these rules and standards, art makes God present in time and space. This is the great trompe l'oeil, the trick of the eye, of Andreas Pazzo, uh, a Jesuit lay brother, who painted this ceiling of the Jesuit church called San Ignazio in Rome. It shows us how, in the plastic arts, for instance, Roman, and by the way, also Bavarian churches, are filled with forms and shapes like saints and angels that mediate between the merely earthly and the purely heavenly. These forms are brightened with light and color and displayed in motion in order to radiate the transcendent glow of nature redeemed by grace. As a result, painting and sculpture can depict reality as ever expanding, as ever in the process of being created anew and afresh by a spiritual impulse welling up 
from within nature, which welling up from within is owing to the action of God, who in grace is constantly redeeming a fallen cosmos. Furthermore, in the realm of Christian spirituality, St. Ignatius Loyola the 16th century founder of the Jesuits, best exemplifies how nature harmoniously and dynamically represents grace. That is, makes grace present in the finite created world of the material creation. The vision of Ignatius is, in fact, the principal expression of the explosive movement of the Baroque. The human person, more than any other creature, because made in the image and likeness of God, represents, that is, makes present, its creator, especially in the use of its freedom. Through the gifts given by grace to the soul in prayer, Human freedom is liberated from the false appearances of freedom that are conjured up in us by what Ignatius calls the enemy of our human nature, that is, the forces of temptation and evil. When grace liberates human freedom of choice from temptation and evil, then human freedom can recreate the world according to the divine image that humanity itself is. This recreation occurs by the acts of love that we do. These acts of love, we might even say, are the highest artworks of human creativity because they make God, whose very essence is love, concrete in the fallen world. Now, let us on this point talk for a moment about how the act of faith that we Christians make opens us up to the life of grace and about how this act of faith has an impact on the whole of the human person. That is, on our mind, free will, five senses, emotions, and affections. The Baroque Age, for its part, understood only too well that our Christian faith is mediated through the powers both of our body and our soul. For instance, the Baroque knew that we first confront Christ and his teachings by the use of our senses. For instance, we hear his message preached, or we read the scriptures with our eyes and then we can use the inner eye of our imaginations to picture the details of Christ's life, his birth, his baptism in the Jordan, his miracles, his Last Supper, his passion and death, his resurrection, and so forth. But the Baroque Age also knew only too well that the encounter of our physical senses with Christ could not possibly be confined to this world only, because Christ, in Christian belief, of course, is true God, as well as truly a human being. So when our senses confront Christ and his message, and our minds understand his teaching and his truth, and our free will choices seek to act out his teachings and truth. It surely follows that Christ's divinity has also flooded us when we know and believe in him. In other words, when we see and hear Christ in and through the scriptures, we cannot help but also come to experience the one God, 
who infinitely transcends this world of time and space. We experience the infinite God when we know Christ because the humanity of Christ is, in fact, one person with the divine word who in Christ has become human. Didn't Christ, for instance, say to Philip in the scriptures when Philip in John's gospel asked to see the Father, the reply was, the person who has seen me, Philip, has indeed seen the Father. So the central message that Baroque art from the Christian perspective gives us is that our bodily senses, our imaginations, our emotions, our minds and intellects, our free wills, all of these have become impregnated with grace when the Christian makes an act of faith. And this impregnation of all the powers of the believing Christian by grace has significant implications for Christians who are artists. The Christian artist, like Pozzo, like Bernini, perhaps like some of us here present, the Christian artist senses the world differently, that is, sees it differently, hears it differently, feels it differently, tastes it differently, even smells it differently. Moreover, the mind or intellect of the Christian artist, the artist's power of reason, understands the world differently, and the free will of the Christian artist has a different type of freedom to act for the good. In short, the grace of faith raises the Christian artist above merely worldly sensations, understanding, and acting, even while the Christian artist still remains very much rooted squarely in the midst of this material world. Through the grace of faith, then, the Christian artist experiences God in the world, not outside the world, but in and through a cosmos redeemed and filled with divinely created energy that the cosmos radiates forth. In other words, the artifacts that the Christian artist makes are themselves, in a rich way, faith infused. They emerge from an experience of God, even as they consist of physical materials that can be felt, seen, heard, and so forth. And because the works of the Christian artist are faith infused, they can then in true in turn diffuse faith widely to other people who savor them, appreciate them, contemplate them, to people, in other words, who are affected when they experience them. Here, for instance, is Bernini's famous sculpture of St. Teresa in Avila, in ecstasy, in the Cornaro Chapel of the Carmelite Church in Rome, we cannot help but notice how faith has activated in the saint's erotic affectivity. And we see in the activation of that affectivity in faith that the human affectivity has been reoriented from a physical sexual encounter to a heightened penetration, if you will, of sanctifying grace in the saint. Well, so much for the good news 
of the harmony between nature and grace that the Christian Baroque embodies. But something has happened in our culture since 1750, when the Baroque age passed, and what has happened has greatly affected Christianity in general and Christian art in particular. Unlike our own time, Baroque Christian art was founded on a central presupposition that today no one can take for granted. That presupposition is simply this. Baroque culture was still God-centered, even Christ-centered, and this centeredness was publicly and privately acknowledged, acted out by people, and given witness to by them. In short, although of course I'm sure there was no lack of sin in the Baroque period, but nonetheless, there was equally no lack of faith to compensate for it, to embrace it, to envelop it, and confidently to redeem it. Faith was alive. People were religious. And so, as we have already seen, because nature and grace were fused into a unity by those living in Baroque culture, a distinctive form of artistic beauty could emerge. Sculptures and paintings of saints and angels could radiate the glow of nature redeemed in an ever-expanding universe of light and color. Grace could be seen as decisively subduing nature. In fact, as we survey Baroque sculpture and paintings, the perduring corrosiveness of sin and evil never seems to hold sway over the victory of grace. Sin and evil almost seem to be an afterthought. Here, for instance, is a sculpture on the facade of the Church of St. Michael, the Jesuit Church, still the Jesuit Church, in Munich, and we notice how the archangel's lance victoriously thrusts the satanic dragon down into defeat. And as we saw in the Jesuit church in Rome, we see heretics at the fringe of the painting falling in limber disgrace at the edges of the ceiling, even while in the center of the painting, the Christian gospel is triumphantly carried unimpeded to the four corners of the known world. But who of us today, even us Christian believers, much less the great numbers of secular skeptics, who of us today cannot feel that there is something naive about the Christian art of the Baroque? Yes, of course, we can still appreciate Baroque Christian art as an ingenious display of human imagination, full of admirable artistic virtuosity, but appreciating it, appreciating it this way is what people do when they visit a museum and look with a degree of detachment on the past products of human achievement. At best, and people say, oh, how extraordinary. And then they move on, unaffected by the deep inner vision that the work of art is trying to express and communicate. I recall, for instance, once making my way to the same Jesuit church in Rome. Oh, it was filled with people but they were all camera-ready tourists, eager to click an image of Pozzo's ceiling. But the sad fact was, as I was told, no, you're a priest? No, you certainly cannot celebrate Mass here during what they later called me were 
opening hours. In short, faith, even in this great church, is squeezed in only before and after sightseeing time. And similarly, on a visit once to Andex, the monastery of Andex on the Amersay outside of Munich, I went in to the still active monastery chapel, a magnificent masterpiece of late Baroque, perhaps Rococo, art by Zimmermann, and I was the sole person there to say a prayer. But there were many, many visitors to the monastery. I could hear them. They were all noisily enjoying themselves in the monastery's beer garden just outside the church. So something has happened in our modern Western consciousness that has dramatically altered our understanding of the relation of God to the world. Something has altered our understanding of grace's relation to nature. And this alteration has rendered the forms of Baroque art less effective, in my judgment, to express the vision of faith and furthermore, to inspire people to the vision of faith. And what is more, this alteration is forcing us to rethink what we mean by Christian beauty, and so likewise to rethink how Christians should do art today. The age in which we now live has often been called modernity. As I say, modernity differs from the Baroque in the way it views, understands, and interprets reality. So let us begin by trying to explain what modernity is and how it differs from the Baroque. I would like to use the theory of Louis Dupre, the Yale philosopher of culture, whom I mentioned earlier. He begins by claiming that we Western human beings, since the days of Socrates and Plato in 4th century BCE Greece, have used the interrelation among three basic components to account for how we make sense of the world. These three components are, first, how we understand the human mind, second, how we understand the material cosmos that the human mind comes to know, when it experiences the phenomena of the cosmos, and third, how we conceive ultimate meaning, usually referred to as transcendence or, if you will, God. Throughout much of the history of the West, these three components were related as follows. The human mind was seen as being able to know the deepest causes of the world because the world was fundamentally understandable. If the human mind were thinking clearly, it could perceive what made the world work because the world was congenially open to human inquiry. When the inquirer came to know the causes of the world, the ideas that the mind formed simply imitated the world. The world, then, was the mind's basic source of meaning, and the mind understood this meaning and was able to articulate it in various ways. So, for instance, Isaac Newton expressed the meaning of the world and ideas like force, mass, acceleration, and so forth, and the human mind was able to put these ideas gotten from an intelligible world into mathematical equations like force equals mass times acceleration. Furthermore, the mind could come to a sure and certain knowledge of ultimate transcendence 
that is, of God. This was because the mind realized that the world, which is its basic source of meaning, could not explain itself. The world surely could be partially explained when the mind found the world's causes, but these causes themselves needed a final or ultimate cause that was not caused by any other cause. And what is more, this ultimate cause had to be the supreme intelligence, which was the designer of the world, a designer that the human mind imitated when it formed its own ideas about the world. In other words, if the ideas of God's mind are the pattern of the created cosmos, then when the human mind knows the cosmos, it follows that the human mind's ideas are windows, icons even, if you will, opening onto the mind of God. But with the advent of modernity, this understanding of the three components has come over time to be markedly altered. And as I say, this alteration has consequences for Christianity in general and Christian art in particular. Dupre, for his part, argues that this alteration began in earnest with the 14th century humanists, Dante and Petrarch, who saw the human mind not as the mere receiver of meaning from the world, whose causes it could inquire into, but rather they saw the mind as itself a source of creative meaning in its own right, a meaning that the human mind then imposed on the world. In short, the pure imitation theory of human knowledge, which originated in Socrates, came to be understood as naive and hence in need of significant renovation. The result of this change, which Dupre calls modernity, is crucial for us 700 years later. To repeat, the human mind in modernity comes to stand in an inventive relation to the external physical cosmos so that now the mind was seen as shaping and forming the physical world, even improving upon it, and thus in some sense doing God one better. Following this modern view, for instance, the 18th century thinker Gotthold Lessing underscored the distinctiveness of art. The role of artists, he claims, is to fashion by their own creative works of art, small worlds that are in fact more perfect than the actual universe itself. For Lessing, artists add a surplus of meaning to the imperfect, even broken reality of the universe that confronts the human mind. In modernity, therefore, the mind's ideas do not first and foremost imitate an intelligible world that we perceive with our senses. On the contrary, the order is reversed. The world now comes to imitate the mind's ideas, which for their part repair and reorder the disjointed external world. Crucially, we notice that with modern modernity a new characteristic comes to define the way human beings understand the cosmos. That characteristic is, in a word, fragmentary. The external world itself is fragmentary. This is because human beings do not see it as a wholly coherent unity. Furthermore, because the human mind can, through art, repair this fragmentation, but only partially, 
the relation of the human mind to the physical world is itself fragmentary. And this means, in turn, that God's relation to the human mind and to the physical cosmos also becomes fragmentary. Why, we might ask? Because if the universe does not appear wholly intelligible to the human mind, then how can the world be designed by an infinitely intelligent designer? And moreover, in modernity, God is much less needed to explain the meaning of the world because the creativity of the human mind is itself capable of enriching the world with its own meaning, most notably in the works of art of its own invention. We can now more fully appreciate why Baroque Christian art can strike the contemporary eye of both the believer and the religious skeptic as naive. Baroque art perceives the twin orders of nature and grace as harmoniously joined, congenially synthesized, in order that they might lead the human person according to an organic steadiness, upward from the beauty of the created cosmos to the beauty of the infinitely designing God from whom it inventively springs forth. But to the modern eye, the twin orders of nature and grace are disjoined, fragmented, and not in any readily apparent sense dovetailed. In other words, in modernity, nature contains dark riddles, and God, if, if God exists, is hidden by these riddles. Moreover, if a designing God is hidden by the nature that God himself purportedly created, then it follows that a God who through the grace of Christ, is said to have redeemed nature, this God is even more opaque to the modern mind. The question then that modernity poses to us is this. How can Christianity continue to do art? Does modernity bring Christian art to a dead end. Well, if we are to answer no, still to give this answer, we do indeed need to recover a deeper, more nuanced sense of Christian art. And to do this, let us turn to one of the most ingenious Christian thinkers of our times, a Swiss priest named Hans Urs von Balthasar, who died at the age of 82 in 1988. His greatest works are seven volumes entitled The Glory of the Lord, Herrlichkeit in the German. He subtitled them a theological aesthetics. This subtitle means that they develop a study of precisely the theme we are discussing, a Christian beauty for modernity. Now, Balthazar begins by reminding us that the principal work of God's grace acted out in the world is the passion and death of Christ, which are the necessary prelude to his resurrection. If this is true, then it follows that in Christ's crucifixion, God must be revealing to us the very nature of beauty, because God alone is the source of all beauty. But 
if God is revealing the nature of beauty in the cross of Christ, then we face what seems to be a contradictory question. How can Christ, suffering innocently on the cross, in degradation and agony, be considered the icon of the infinitely beautiful God? In one sense, of course, Christians have grown accustomed to thinking of the crucifixion as aesthetically pleasing. It is the subject of numerous works of art and is commonly displayed in homes and churches. However laudable this pious custom may be, we do need to probe it more deeply. Because the, crucif the crucifixion seems, for instance, to run against what many people would define as the very hallmark of the experience of beauty. Namely, that beauty gives us a universal sense of satisfaction. We receive, in other words, a distinctive sense of joy when we contemplate a work of art. St. Thomas Aquinas says that this satisfaction comes from the delight that is given to our senses, our imaginations, and our minds by the intrinsic symmetry of the world as it is imitated in the work of art. All of us, of course, know this delight when, for example, we contemplate the majesty of the great panoramas of nature, such as Ireland's Cliffs of Moor and Arizona's Grand Canyon. We feel it when we stand enthralled by architectural wonders like the Parthenon in Greece and the Pantheon in Rome. The yearning for this delight draws us repeatedly to concert halls and to the world's great museums whose treasures help us to purify and elevate and transform the otherwise restrictive routine of normal daily life. But, by contrast, the crucifixion stands as a universal metaphor for injustice, torture, and death. These are among the chief moral and physical evils of the human condition that repel us in their ugliness. It is therefore not surprising that St. Paul, writing in the first century, saw the cross as the chief obstacle to preaching the gospel. The cross was, as he says, a scandal to the Greeks and an absurdity to reason. It is so because it seems devoid, when taken on its own terms, of any power to delight. And it seems devoid of any power to delight precisely because it seems devoid of symmetry, harmony, and intelligibility. We might, for a moment, consider Grunewald's great altarpiece, renowned as a touchstone of German art. It is one of many artifacts that try to confer an alluring beauty on the agony and humiliation of Christ, which it nonetheless depicts with grim, the even grisly, realism. It was commissioned before 1516 for a hospital chapel near Eisenheim in Alsace, now in France. It was intended to serve as a catharsis that would draw forth and thereby ease the pain of patients suffering from a now rare gangrenous disease. Now, there can be only one justification for conferring delight on such a morally problematic subject that somehow 
the subject is intrinsically beautiful. But once our faith tells us that the crucifixion is beautiful, once, in other words, we Christians say that the supreme measure of beauty is the ignominy of the death of God's only begotten Son, then we are led to wonder whether the Grand Canyon, the Pantheon, the Mona Lisa, the Cliffs of Moore, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, are in fact authentically beautiful. Why? Because somehow, in the cross, God has made what seems ugly beautiful. And so what God reveals as supremely beautiful, the cross, seems strangely twisted out of kilter with what we normally experience as beautiful. Now, surely, Balthazar does not want to deprive us of the usual sense of joy, satisfaction, and delight that we feel when our hearing feasts on Bach and our sight feasts on Caravaggio or on Michelangelo's Dome of St. Peter's or on California's magnificent Pacific coastline. But it, he does want us to see that in the crucifixion of his son, God reveals an extraordinarily new type of symmetry, harmony, and intelligibility that heals a fragmentary world torn asunder by sin. God reveals a beauty that trumps all that the natural eyes of human beings understand as beautiful. Balthazar wants us to see that God, yes, still the intelligent designer, has not sent into the world the beauty of Christ, first and foremost to give delight and pleasure. On the contrary, God has revealed to us Christ's beauty, this distinctive, strange beauty, to arouse in us a sense of awe and worship so that when we confront the cross, we will ask in the words of the great hymn, what wondrous love is this, O my soul? The cross brings us starkly face to face with a wondrous but a bizarre beauty. The creator of the universe taking the form of a slave, laying down his divine life for evildoers, emptying himself, as St. Paul says, of divinity, drawing the grotesque ugliness of injustice, innocent suffering, and death up into his own very self. The cross once and for all repairs and reorders the cosmos, so poignantly felt by the modern mind as fractured and riddled by imperfection, as opposed to the Baroque's view of cosmic symmetry and harmony. So, in light of Balthazar's understanding of Christian beauty based on the cross, we need now to ask, what is the task of Christian art today. Could we not say that its task is to fashion works of art which, on the one hand, will continue to arouse the modern person's sense of beauty, but which, on the other hand, will, will reach out from within the very fractures and riddles that the modern mind finds 
pockmarking the cosmos. In order to make God, who seems dark and distant, present, closer, proximate, capable of a mutual relation with us. In a word, credible. But how can this task, which may seem like a contradiction, be done? Well, I suggest that past achievements can offer us some guiding models. Let us return, for instance, to the Eisenheim altarpiece of Grunewald. The grim realism of Christ's agony depicted here, combine, combined with Christ's own gangrenous body, starkly, even shockingly, contrasts with the beauty of the painting's color and technical genius. These, the color and technical genius, display symmetry and harmony, and thus they can give us a certain delight, even as their vivid display of the crucifixion's moral and physical evil can repel us. The painting thus limits, even rudely halts, the aesthetic pleasure that, on the other hand, it does indeed elicit in us. In other words, the work embodies not a contradiction, but a paradox. The alluring beauty of the work's color, technical genius, and symmetry draws us into contemplating the apparent ugliness of its crucified theme. Our mind is thus stimulated to ponder, even contemplate, this paradox, which the work of art in and of itself does not resolve. The painting, obviously, cannot audibly speak, so it does not directly teach us that God's self-sacrificing love constitutes ultimate beauty. Such a lesson can only be known directly by those who explicitly make an act of Christian faith. This is what the patients in the Eisenheim Hospital in the 16th century did when they prayed in its chapel in front of the altarpiece. So because they believed the Christian message, the altarpiece in the 16th century could easily fulfill its comforting purpose. But I would suggest that even in our own time, the altarpiece continues to speak, not just to Christians who believe the message, but to modern religious skeptics who see and hear the message of the altarpiece in a different way. Precisely because to the modern skeptics who view it, it now offers far more confusion than comfort. The painting provokes a wonder in the skeptic that can create an opening for faith potentially to enter. This opening is brought about ironically by the emptiness that a modern person might feel when gazing on it. No one, however skeptical, can finally escape the question insistently posed to the thousands who visit the painting each year in the city of Colmar. What attitude could prompt a human genius to render so ugly a message so beautifully? This is a riddle and it challenges modernity's own riddles about a distant and dark God uninvolved with a fractured and fragmented world. So I suggest that indeed 
the painting still can evoke God's transcendence, but it does so implicitly, even vaguely. It evokes transcendence because it denies that the beauty of its own sensuous and technical symmetry is sufficient to explain the full breadth and depth of the painting's artistic message. In other words, the meaning of the altarpiece lies today not so much in the religious attitude that inspired its painter and his original audience, but in the modern mind's incapacity to render it fully intelligible. In short, the altarpiece presses on the modern skeptic a question that cries out for an answer. Now, a more recent work that confronts modernity is Georges Rouault's depiction of the face of Christ. It appeared in various versions between 1912 and 1950. Rouault carries on a tradition found in El Greco, Domenico Fetti, Gabriel Max, and others of representing the icon of Christ's face attributed to Veronica's veil. Like Grunewald, Rouault pushes modern persons to stretch the limits of what they usually experience as beautiful. The painting possesses a strange symmetry, even as its color tends toward the dull and heavy. Its technical mastery does not readily dazzle. In fact, nothing at all seems handsome about the face. Nor does the face, in any strict sense of the word, seem even representational of humanity. On the contrary, Christ appears distorted, certainly idiosyncratic, and not evocative of ready sympathy. These apparent deficiencies pose a riddle in the contrast between the face on the one hand and our usual expectation that art will display aesthetically pleasing, beautiful human beings. As with Grunewald, this riddle stimulates our eye to a closer study, hopeful of drawing forth the world, the, uh, the work's hidden beauty. This hope arises from what one commentator calls the painting's plasticity. By plasticity, he means that, ironically, the image's drabness actually represents universal humanity. Who, we may find ourselves asking as we study the work, who does the Christ resemble? Is it an Ashkenazi Jew or an Hispanic Indian? Is it an illegal immigrant? Perhaps it is a migrant worker or a Polynesian fisherman. Is it a Basque shepherd or a mechanic in Turin's Fiat factory? Or a Mongolian subsisting near the Russian border? Is it Joshua, or is it a Canaanite prince? Is it Isaac, or is it Ishmael? Whatever human being we might see in this mirror of humanity that Ruo's Christ is, it is one and the same Christ who, we Christians believe, as the poet says, plays in the features of all human faces, in these faces which are limitlessly diverse, one and the same Christ is lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. And so the artifact does radiate beauty because the one Christ arouses in us and deepens in us a sense of human solidarity. Put another way, contemplating the passion of Christ, 
and the love that motivates it plunges us into the rich panoply of the fractured struggles that make up the human condition. And conversely, when we love humanity in the commonness, even the vulgarity of its struggles, we are immersed more into Christ. What then do Grunewald and Rouault teach us about the future of Christian art? Both maestros confront the modern person with the possibility that a redeeming God is alive and active in the depths of humanity's disjointed, broken, fragmented condition. They remind us, unlike the Baroque, that nature is struggling and so by no means yet finally extricated from its tragic situation, but that in the depths of this situation, a transcendent mercy may indeed be reconcilingly working its wondrously healing, self-sacrificing love. And it is here that we touch the distinctive beauty of the God revealed by and in Christ. Good evening, everybody. I thank the organizers of this symposium for including me as a respondent. Um, you, Professor Fields, examine the visual arts through the lens of theological studies. And I think your lecture reflects your familiarity with aesthetics, a branch of philosophy that emerged in the 18th century. Significantly, the birth of aesthetic philosophy coincided with the emergence of artistry as an academic discipline, likewise in the period of the Enlightenment. It has been recognized that in contrast to earlier centuries, today the two disciplines are rarely in dialogue. Scholars of aesthetic philosophy have in fact been criticized by art historians for using artifacts merely as a backdrop for their theories, instead of closely examining the works and valuing them in their own right. To be fair, even art historians are occasionally confronted with a similar critique of their having moved away from the actual art, especially after Erwin Panofsky's methodology of iconological analysis became widespread over the course of the 20th century. Such concerns remind us that as scholars, we are accountable for the approaches and methods we pursue, the categories we employ, and the assumptions we make when we advance our argument. And I will obviously mostly be speaking from the perspective of art history. First slide, please. Um, your lecture has triggered many thoughts and questions. For instance, why do you so decidedly separate Christian artists and their products from other art? Even in the culture of the Baroque that you call God-centered, and justly so, it was typical of artists to accept commissions for a range of topics. Artists of the early modern period commonly conceived of themselves, their skills, and their art as divinely inspired. And they innocently extended the same claim to their works representing, for instance, themes derived from ancient myth. Who or what, after all, is the Christian artist? Nowadays, many people would agree that Bernini's works are extremely appealing, or let's say, beautiful. Yet some intellectuals of the Enlightenment, for example, characterized his sculptures as exaggerated and a plague on taste to reference an influential dictionary on the fine arts published in Italy shortly before 1800. The very term aesthetics emerged relatively late alongside aesthetic philosophy. 
It acknowledges and indeed emphasizes the role of the senses in the human cognition of beauty. And importantly though, to this day, there is no such thing as a coherent theory on what exactly constitutes beauty or taste. Beauty, after all, is in the eye of the beholder. It is indeed particularly your discussion of beauty or what you term Christian beauty to which I want to respond, starting with a basic question. Why do you accord to beauty such a central place in art, particularly art representing Christian topics? Next slide. The discourse about the role of the senses in human approaches to works of art goes back a long way, of course. And the debates around the legitimacy of Christian icons in Byzantium during the 8th and 9th centuries are a case in point. The period is commonly called iconoclasm, and it almost put an early end to Christian art. Seeking to defend icons, Byzantine thinkers developed sophisticated theories about sacred art and its merits that were informed by both ancient Greek philosophy and Christian theology. Following Aristotle, several authors highlighted the primacy of the sense of sight. They qualified religious art as indispensable for the faithful communication with the divine to attain salvation. Importantly though, Claims regarding beauty are in Byzantium almost entirely lacking from the rich body of theoretical arguments defending Christian art. This is in fact not surprising. Ancient philosophers like Plato or the Stoics did not discuss beauty in relation to the visual arts. Although remarks about artifacts deemed beautiful are occasionally encountered in ancient and medieval literature, Explicit statements are rare and relevant theories are lacking. For very long, there wasn't even an appropriate terminology for what we are accustomed to calling the fine arts, or beaux-arts in French, signifying the beautiful arts. To this day, Orthodox Christians, when they approach icons for veneration, do not expect these icons to be aesthetically appealing in the first place even if some icons may well be perceived as beautiful. What the faithful expect or, rarely or rely on is the element of likeness, that the portrait closely resembles its living prototype is the most requisite trait of icons in official theological writings from the early Middle Ages that remain valid for Orthodox Christians to this day. The icon can pass on the prayers of the faithful to the respective holy person in heaven because the icon closely resembles that person, not because the icon is beautiful. One could cite more examples from both the history of art and the history of ideas to further illustrate that beauty has most often not been the most pivotal criterion in the making, perception, practical use, and interpretation of art objects. Art is a timeless and indispensable means of human creativity and expression. And at all times, artists have addressed the most fundamental human and artistic concerns. Professor Field's last example of Wuol's reception of the Veronica illustrates this well. You have characterized the image you showed as not handsome, even distorted. I suspect that many of us agree with your assessment of representations of a theme with which this painter was fascinated. What, if not beauty, may have triggered the artist's interest in the subject? The long history of art suggests that artists through the ages have been familiar with the pictorial and cultural traditions of their chosen subject matter. I'm not surprised at all to see in the studios of my artist friends some of the same books that I also own and draw on in my scholarship. Rouault is a particularly thought-provoking case of an artist responding to and seeking his own place within a tradition that reaches a long way back. Next slide. The Veronica, a miraculous icon of Christ, has been intensely venerated in the Catholic realm since around 1200. Its many replicas, which continue to be pro produced to this day, clearly testify to the object's lasting religious significance 
and cultural interest, regardless of the fact that the original in Rome was reported lost centuries ago. The Veronica was believed to have been one of several unmade icons of Christ dating from the time of his ministry or passion. His image supposedly imprinted itself on pieces of linen in the very moment when he touched the textiles to his face. Miraculous images, like the Veronica in Rome, were believed to be authentic to an utmost degree, an idea that is mirrored in the legend of the eponymous saint, the first owner of the cloth. The saint's very name was by medieval thinkers explained etymologically. Vera Icona, in Latin, signifies the true image. The narrative makes important claims about the nature of Christ, the legitimacy of his visual portraits, and the limits of artistic representation. All of this must have appealed to Ruald, an artist of modernity, who was also a devout practitioner of the Christian faith. It wasn't the rendering of beauty, I think, but the rendering of truth that, is, that interested this artist, both spiritually and artistically. The arts of the modern era are not only fascinating, but indeed thriving because of their vast thematic range and the multifarious approaches of artists to visual representation in a great variety of media and techniques. In response to your question regarding the future of Christian art in particular, it is telling that Christian art over the centuries successfully survived several initiatives that were directed at its complete extinction. Christian artistic devotional practice from the past to the present illustrates that Christian art has many merits. And I would certainly not want to exclude from its benefits the amazed tourist who views sacred art in a museum or church. The long durée of Christian art and thought strongly suggests that the future of Christian art that does not necessarily depend on its aesthetic appeal. In fact, Christian art may safely be disentangled from expectations of beauty as its major or even exclusive trait. Thank you. Good evening. It's really good to be back at the University of Chicago, back into this great intellectual community which I uh, love so much and which I enjoyed, particularly with the Committee on Social Thought when I was uh, creating uh, Christara, the sculpture in the John Creer Library. The thought that you're here uh, for this topic uh, thrills me. Uh, it uh, says that there is a hunger uh, for, for Christian art. And of course, my question is, what Christian art? <laughs> Where is this Christian art? Where can you show me that this, there is this Christian art? Um, they, uh, I, I feel definitely that there is a void uh, and that maybe, uh, maybe this present void can be filled. That the vector of retardation that we're in at this moment in terms of presenting Christianity through art, can change and can pivot to the vector of progression. That creates the question, again, what is Christian art? By adding it, that little verb kind of changes it again. And then, then we're into another situation. We are in to um, a, a, a real investigation, putting aside the emotional, the attachment, the narrative, all of these things that make up the, this aspect of art. I think that Christian art 
is invention. I think that whenever civilizations have asked for people to gather together to uh, contemplate the Almighty, that they have been able to go out of themselves and that they have been uh, able to draw upon all of their present and their past. They've appropriated from many different areas a, a, a consensus that is made plastic in creating a temple. So our, our classical structure of Christian art certainly begins from the Greek temples. It was important that they be so strong that they elicit people to come to them, to gather, and to uh, fulfill their life within the, the uh, structure that, they, that has been defined by them. And I think that um, if, we, if, we, if we stop for a minute uh, and just quickly look at Christianity uh, in, in terms of temples, uh, one that was made just after the, the, the time of Christ, uh, the Pantheon, uh, under the Emperor Domitian in the year 800, that cer certainly was a major invention to be able to take 45 meters of space within a non-supporting dome. Amazing. So what is next in that? Next is Hagia Sophia. Taking the same principles, going back to the past, taking the principles that were developed in uh, the pantheon and applying them and inventing a new, a new invention, the pendentive, which is holding up the stone. And the, in what, 537, or a scholar on Byzantine art, I think something like that, under the emperor Justinian. This building, of course, expands itself uh, to be able to still capture the imagination of any visitor today. At the time, made in a pandemic, uh, as I understand, it was 10,000 workers in six years created this gigantic, amazing structure. And that was so important that for the first time, we have a signed piece of architecture. Isidore of Miletus and uh, Amathemus of Chali. Two, two signatures on a, on a work of art. So now the author is becoming to be part of it. The next author, in another 500 years, is Abbot Sujet and Saint-Denis. So we're getting these cycles of, of, of 500 years. So he was able to take what was present, which is the proper ap approach, and that is the, uh, the, the invention, the technology, the engineering, to be able to bring light into a space, and take the industrial invention at the same time, which is glass being made, able to be made in sheets, and then to be able to color that glass, starting to put all of these arts together into a form as a Gothic cathedral, which we know uh, still remains with us in all of the poor uh, 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 copies that are used as parish 
churches in many places in, in North America. <clears throat> the, the Duomo comes next. Again, just taking this idea of enclosing space. And, and so the uh, invention of Brunelleschi, who himself was an inventor uh, and gave us perspective, uh, is for about 1420. And another 100 years, Michelangelo took that dome of uh, the Dome of Firenze in to, uh, to St. Peter's and, and making it absolutely beautiful. So, but in both cases, they, they are, are stunning. And then, taking that space again, we have another architect, Max Abramovitz, who designed the, the Trade Center, uh, the United Nations Building in New York, and Lincoln Center. And he made a geodesic uh, dome of two pieces, two uh, uh, saucers placed on top of each other, the assembly hall at the University of Illinois. And is taking and advancing that same principle. However, it wasn't used as a temple. So we have that same theme each time making another step, but not, but not for God. Because that is done in our secular culture, which, as Father Field says, is fragmented. But, but the thing that's important within these temples is that they brought the other arts with them. So, uh, if, well known for, the, uh, for Hagia Sophia, the great Byzantine beauty, uh, it, within each one of these uh, moments in time, painting and uh, sculpture uh, are are brought into that framework. However, the cross itself, in terms of Christian history, and, and uh, used was probably not until the third century, just a cross. And then uh, a crucifixion, uh, one of the earliest is probably Santa Sabina, uh, a carved wood piece on a, uh, the, the door, a door with three figures, uh, the Christ in an Aron's position, and the two thieves on either side, but no cross. And that was uh, around 430. And then um, the, the, uh, uh, the next uh, big one, uh, was a wooden cross, eight feet high, uh, and it was placed uh, in Lucca and made out of wood. Now, that's the first crucifixion as such is freestanding. So the third century, the sixth century, and then the ninth century, there's these gaps. We have this pendulum. We have this period of rest in a period of progression and in invention. Key, key to that. And then we know that the art that Father presented uh, through, through the uh, Baroque and even into Mannerism is to the rich heritage of our lives. That's what we call Christian art. Um, how did that art come about? That's why I'm here with you tonight, because we know that that art came about because of patronage. And I know that you're here because you're thinking of the future too, 
you're thinking what is the future, what is Christian art. So tonight, I'm an iconoclast. <laughs> I'm not showing any slides. Maybe the first time I have ever spoken in public without slides behind me. <laughs> and so these scribbles have, have, to, have to kind of make up for that. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I'm here because this future is your future. And it's yours. Art is not made by one person or even just a team. Great art comes about because of the community, supporting it in so many different ways. So I'm not trying to imagine what that future is going to be, except, except the fact that there is a reason for it. There is a passion for it. That we really do want to ad ad advance the history of art, which I, I think is the history of civilization. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we want to do it in a way that is quite inventive. If we come from a society that so much is there uh, from, and, and so, so much so quickly, and that you are in a visual age, uh, that th this is new. Uh, we, we, we didn't have visuals all day long. All you have to do is put your hand in your pocket and you got a visual. Wow. Uh, when you, you talked about art before, it, it wasn't like this. In the modern age, yes, it's fragmented. Yes, it is uh, struggling uh, to find itself. But I don't think that we've reached this state of maturity yet. I don't think we've reached that state of where we have been able to create the invention, the icon, the, the element that somehow binds people together on multiple different levels. How, you know, how, how does that come about? Now, even within this modern age, we have some really good examples of great temples. And the best of all is Matisse's Chapel of Our Lady of the Rosary in Vence. Matisse was uh, in Vence because he was uh, trying to, to get away from the bombing, which it was expected uh, in Nice, where he had a great a great flat and studio in the Regina. And he was recovering from surgery. And the house that he took was across the street from uh, a house that the Dominican sisters were running as a, uh, as a nursing facility, uh, long care. So Matisse, in his own recovering from surgery, put an ad in the paper that he wanted a night nurse and a pretty one. <laughs> and one of the individuals who was be being cared for in that nursing facility of the Dominicans across the street from the house of Matisse answered the ad. And um, her name um, uh, was uh, Sister something. 
um, uh, her her name was Monique Bourgeois, and so he, she did take care of, of Matisse, and he did draw her, and they did become friends. And then she went to Paris and uh, came back, and their friendship continued, and he continued drawing her. And then she went back to Paris. Things how these things happen. She went back to Paris and entered the Dominican convent, and now becomes Sister uh, Jacques Marie. Sister Jacques Marie told some of the Dominican priests in Paris that she worked for Matisse. Wow, and these priests were the priests who were concerned about the lack of sacred art in France. And, uh, and they had a, a, a magazine which was quite good and quite active, and I certainly used when I was in college, the soccer art. And one of them, uh, Father, uh, uh, sorry, I want to make it, get his name right, Marie Alain Coutier, uh, was uh, an artist also. So he got really excited about this. And uh, they, they sent a, a brother uh, down to Mans, Brother Louis Bertrand, and he visited Matisse and said, I think you should make a chapel for these nuns across the street. And I think you should put all that you have into this chapel. Just don't decorate a shelter that somebody's making. Put it all together. So the, the, the priest back in Paris, and his brother, and an architect in, in Vence convinced Matisse to do this. He then, as you know, how many have been, how many have you been to the Chapel of the Rosary? Or maybe I should have shown this slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, go. You will find God. Four years, four years Matisse worked on this. He made life-size maquettes. So and here is this man who says at, at the end of his life that he uh, had, I'd like to get that quote right. <clears throat> Uh, that, he, that he said that uh, all I did, I started with a secular, and now in the evening of my life, I, nat I naturally end with the divine. But at the dedication, he made the ultimate statement. He said, this work has taken me four years of exclusive and diligent work, and it is the result of my entire working life. Despite all the unperfect imperfections, I consider it to be my masterpiece. And there's no doubt about it. It's a masterpiece. It brings you to God. And these are the moments that have happened within the modern period. That was, he started, as I said, in 42, uh, 44, 
began the church in 47 to uh, completed in the early 50s. At the same time, this uh, Jean-Marie Coutier uh, got the church in uh, Assis, where he brought all of these other artists together to try to introduce, after the war, the importance of the divine. It's a great piece. And then in another Swiss Alp lo location, Le Grandchamp, Le, Co Le Cobusier created a masterpiece also. So these are just some highlights that have gone on in this period. Uh, but as you know, they are few and far between. For ourselves here, I think we have one also. Uh, when I was in college, I was going, tracing Marcel Boyer's great work. So it, actually, in one of the galleries of the, the old Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue, you know, I, I think that it is as contemplative a space as you can be in. But his churches were also quite inventive. And uh, the Benedictines at the time were taking the lead in uh, reju rejuvenation of the liturgy. So he created the chapel at St. John's University in Collegeville, a uh, convent for the nuns in uh, North Dakota. Uh, but recently, the Cardinal Archbishop of Los Angeles, Mahoney, uh, because of the fire that they burnt their own cathedral down, uh, decided to create a new cathedral. And they acquired five acres of land on the uh, Hollywood freeway. Now, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the Hollywood freeway because my sculpture, Star Dance, which is 135 feet long and rests on a roof and uh, extends 35 feet over the freeway. Uh, it, 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 and, and that this piece of property uh, looks just like it uh, in the terms of the way it addresses the street. A group of uh, people who were involved in the financing of this church came to me and said, we would like to put star dance here, uh, or uh, star steps here. And uh, too many pieces with stars, you know. Uh, and I said, well, I don't think it's a prop uh, appropriate. So the Angelinos called it a stairway to heaven. That's what they thought the name of it was, not star steps. Therefore, they thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, but they commissioned uh, four good, great architects to uh, make uh, proposals. And they chose uh, Jose Rafael Monino from Spain, a professor of architecture in Madrid, um, the great architect, to create this piece. And he created a postmodern structure. At Corbusier's, back, all the way back in uh, 1955, uh, was also a, a postmodern structure. But this piece doesn't have a right angle in it. It has no campanile. It has uh, none of the treatments that you think that a church should have. And it sits on this plot. Now, the plot is important because it's across from Frank Gehry's new uh, uh, symphony hall the Disney uh, building, across from the city hall, and across from a, another auditorium. So it's, it, within a cultural field and another block away is their contemporary art museum. So they, he created something that absolutely involves, started from scratch, but brings 
appropriates all that is good in the past of bringing to a temple, to a platform, the people to worship. And by doing that, he first commissioned three artists for the building. Dan Graham made this series of gates with the Blessed Mother uh, on, uh, on like the keystone's position. Um, and there is a plaza that is made for people. Like Courbusier's Ranchon, that church was actually made for people to sit on the side of the mountain and attend mass on the, which was being held on the outside of the building. This has some, some of that feeling, but an ambulatory that raised and walked around uh, the church, and, and within that there were shrines, and then within that space itself, it's, over, it, it's overpoweringly beautiful. Uh, and as you exit the church, you, you go to the other side, you, instead of more shrines, you get art galleries that he placed there. And within them, when I, times that I've been there, there's all children art from the different schools uh, being exhibited, but they also exhibit uh, artists from, from the community. And then you go out into a garden. And I was there for Easter. And after Mass, I probably spent three hours in, I couldn't leave it. And so, you know, maybe we, I need to get Easter dinner someplace. And sure enough, at the back of this plaza is an open air restaurant <laughs> I think it was three dollars for a lamb dinner. <laughs> Not a restaurant to make money, but a restaurant to be able to provide food for the people who are the parishioners and for the guests. It was, it was, he just pulled this whole thing together. So, in iconoclastic traditions, what, what do we expect? What do I expect of you? Take Pope Francis's notion, first of all, of a church. I don't think in any way he sees it the way we, that, that we are participating in church today. He sees it as a field house, little, that you are completely engaged in God's love to others. He wants a church that is open to everybody. The idea is to bring the message of Christ to everybody, to bring God's love to everybody. And within painting in this period of time, we've also had some major highlights, which are transforming for the, for the artist himself. Mark Chagall, White Crucifixion, which we have here in Chicago, which you've all visited and, and seen, as well as his very last work, a tapestry in now the Shirley Ryan Rehabilitation Lab, was commissioned under Henry Betts, who went to Vance also, or St. Paul de Vance, where Chagall was living, he commissioned his last piece. And that tapestry, tells the story of the, the, the pilgrim journey from Egypt all the way through, down and up to the crucifixion.
Chagall loved God. He was an active, devoted practitioner of the Jewish religion. But he, re he realized God's redeeming act in, in, that, in that crucifixion. How do, why do we have so much of Chagall in this country? What did he do? Um, and how, how was he able to do it in this country? He did it through patronage, right back to where we've been right through before the secular age. First of all, Maritain's wife, Reza, was a poet. Chagall was a poet. When he came from Ukraine to Paris, the, the Maritans and Chagall became deep, good, great friends. And then Maritain came to New York to teach at Princeton, brought, Merit brought Chagall along, gave that endorsement, and you know what we have. The churches that he did for Rockefeller, Lincoln Center's tapestries, uh, canvas tapestries, uh, and our own uh, two great pieces in Chicago. Though, uh, it, you know, when an artist dies, it's, it's sometimes all over, because they took the piece that was made, the stained glass window for the Art Institute, which was created for the trees and, the, and the, to be seen, the light to emanate uh, from the courtyard into the glass. So um, I, I know you want to sit there, so we'll, we'll but I'll mention a, Another another work, uh, Bill Viola did the Annunciation, a video projection piece, stunning. I saw it again in Rome this year, absolutely stunning. So the question is, what can you do? so that there's going to be images on this screen. How, as a community, since all of these pieces came about that I brought as an example, because of community, because of support, because of their trust in the artist, and of their love of God. I think that's Christian art. The future is yours. All right.